Uh, hey, I think you should consider taking this leadership position. Hey, I think you should consider doing the MDiv. Um, hey, you, you look great in probably doing this type of position. And, and just people really speaking truth into me. And so I think the biggest thing that I would say uh, just to anybody in there is uh, dream with others and continue. If you're a leader in your church, like speak into others and, and dream for them. Because the only reason that I'm here today is because people dreamt for me, imagined for me, and gave me a concept of that. Um, and I think another big struggle that I had uh, just in considering ministry was that I kept com comparing myself to other male role models that I had grown up with. So uh, if I said, hey, God, I, I don't think I could do this ministry thing because I'm not like um, so-and-so, and I'm not like so-and-so, and so-and-so, and, -so, and then I started to realize, hey, I'm just comparing myself to males. And then when I went to females, uh, uh, just to comparing myself to other female role models I had, I'm like, wait, I can't even live up to what they've done, or I can't do uh, anything that they, I can't think the way that they think. I'm not as smart enough. You know, there's the whole comparison game. And, um, and then I had another, uh, other leaders that kind of spoke into me in that moment and said, hey, Janet, do you know you're comparing yourself to people who are twice your age? I was like, oh, I, I guess. <laughs> uh, like, and so it's just kind of this idea again of like, hey, you, you still have a journey to go through and um, you still have a lot to learn, but again, we see potential in you. And so I'm thankful for all those leaders who spoke into me um, and imagined for me. And I'm still in a pl place where I'm like, I don't have it all together. Um, I felt this call from God to go into ministry. I don't know what that means, um, but I'm so thankful for the community that's been around me that is um, dreaming with me, that is uh, grace, grace, graceful with me, that is like, okay, let's try things out with you. Like, let's try to put you in this position. Hey, if you don't like it, that's fine. Like, okay, if this isn't a good fit, let's, let's try over here. Um, so I'm thankful that I have that community around that is willing to fail with me, whatever the concept of failure is, you know, um, but that is willing to um, journey with me and dream. And so again, I, I encourage anybody that's really considering that uh, at this moment is don't feel like you have to have it all figured out. Um, that don't feel like you aren't enough. Don't feel like uh, you have to be smart enough or be like so-and-so. Um, that God is calling and looking for a leader just like you. Uh, it may not look like the concept of leadership you've been role modeled or that's been around you. Uh, because I think there's something new and different that God is doing and is, is moving uh, in your hearts to do something different. And it may not look like anything you've you've seen around you, and I think that's exactly what God wants. Well, as you can tell, we have amazing panelists here, and I would love to open this up for a couple of questions. Uh, I believe my friend Allison has the first one. Um, you want to come on up here, Allison? I'll hand you over the mic. But be thinking about a question and come on up and ask it. Make our way through here. All right, I have a general question, whoever wants to answer it. Um, I want to know what your first ministry experience was and how this um, being in this role changed you. Thank you. My very first ministry role was an internship in Pukalani on the island of Maui in Hawaii. <laughs> I know, which I really fit in there, right? Um, I was a youth slash children intern, and it was an incredible summer, uh, but that summer the pastor asked me to preach um, on a Sunday morning. I had been teaching the Sunday school for the children most Sunday mornings. There was a, a man who was very happy to let me teach his daughter in children's ministry and tell her about Jesus and the love of God and teach her about scripture, um, but that Sunday that I got up to preach, he, in protest, waited for me to begin preaching so that he could stand up and um, walk out the back doors and he took his daughter out of that church, and um, I didn't see them again for the rest of the summer. I hope that they returned at some point, um, but that was my very first <laughs> assignment in ministry. It was also very life-giving in other ways, um, but I was a very idealistic college student. I didn't understand that there were barriers to women in ministry. Um, I was young and, and just thought that all the doors were open, and so that was my first kind of rubber meets the road experience in realizing that not everything is like the university setting, because in universities, there's so much welcome and inclusion, um, and in local churches, sometimes we meet a very different path. Uh, my very first experience was teaching Sunday school, and um, at that time, I, I love scripture. I 
love it and I use it consistently. It is constantly on my mind. And what comes to mind when I taught was as I was teaching and looking at uh, the scriptures, um, again, it was Paul. Paul has been my, Paul in scripture has been my greatest, besides my husband, um, uh, support. He's been my mentor um, through the word. And he says in Corinthians chapter five, he says, you know, if you've been born again, you are a new creature. Again, there's no male or female there. And that he brought it about in Christ Jesus. And that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Everyone in this room has been given the ministry of reconciliation. And not only has he given us the ministry of reconciliation, but he said, Kay, I have given you the word of reconciliation. And I hold that very dear that I hold within me, in the spirit, the word of reconciliation. And from that time, at the age of 18, I have had a deep longing um, to use the word of reconciliation. And I knew it then, that's what I'm going to do. I didn't know I would be a pastor, um, but that really had nothing to do with my sex. It had to do with I wanted to be a mother. Well, I get to be both. Yeah, go ahead, Deborah. And we have a microphone set up over here as well, so come on up and ask your question. I mentioned a little bit about um, my first position uh, being in a Korean church. Um, I had just uh, gotten my MDiv from Fuller, and I was 26, very young, very inexperienced. And so I remember um, being at a Korean church in the valley, uh, and I lasted one year. Um, Soon after I got uh, into the position of being a full-time uh, Christian education pastor, I was in charge of preaching for the children and for the youth and just taking care of the young adults and the Korean-American uh, English-speaking uh, young adults in the Korean church. Um, soon after I got to that position, um, a secretary, the secretary of the church uh, was on a matern maternity leave. And so, um, as I had mentioned earlier, the pastor said, uh, you can learn to, to type Korean really quickly, um, and can you do this? And so I was on the typewriter learning to, to, to type in Korean, producing these uh, Korean bulletins right away. Um, and then um, being, a, um, being, being able to speak Korean um, became a liability for me because then the pastor said, well, you should attend all the, all the worship services. Uh, you are uh, on the pastoral team, so you need to be a good example. So uh, you need to go to the Wednesday night service, the Friday night service, and the Sunday services, and of course the early morning services as well. In the Korean church, uh, there's a tradition, a great tradition, of uh, early morning prayer services daily, sometimes seven days a week. Um, and so, um, you know, great expectation. And then um, the pastor learned that I play piano. <laughs> and so on Wednesday nights, I was asked to play the piano for the Wednesday night service. So one day I went up to the pastor and said, you know, I realized that on Wednesdays I'm here uh, 10, 12 hours because I start in the morning, finish up my day, and then I wait for the evening service to start at 7, and I am on the piano and finish it out, and, and I leave, um, you know, at 9, 10 in the evening. And so I said, would, would it be okay if I came later on in, on in the day on Wednesdays? And the pastor said, you have to learn the work ethic. Um, and uh, the 9 to 5 is your role as the Christian education uh, pastor, but the evening thing is your volunteer work. You're serving the Lord. What is the reservation? Um, so that co conversation kind of failed. And um, we were building an education building, so I was actually sharing one big space with the senior pastor for several months. Um, and um, I remember going up to the pastor, which uh, really became the breaking point for me at that point. And that was, I said to him, you know, the, the way that I am working here in the rate that I do with all these administrative things that I'm doing, I don't have time to prepare my sermons for Sunday. So what do, you, what do I do? What, what do you do? And the pastor, you know, and I said, you know, at this rate, I'm going to burn out and I will have nothing to offer to the young kids. And I was being very honest. 
And I will never forget his response. And his response was, you know what? I experienced the same thing. And many, many years ago, my heart already turned into ashes, burned out and out. And, but you have to keep going. You have to keep serving. And at that moment, I said to myself, they're not speaking out loud, I said to the pastor, I said, if your heart is in ashes, you have no business being a pastor. You have nothing to offer. And then all this internal struggle of, why did I go to seminary to get my MDiv, thinking that I would go into ministry and win souls for the Lord, and here I am having these kinds of conversations and being kind of hitting the wall with ministry, not having enough time to pre uh, prepare for my sermons. Um, and then the education building was opened, and I was given an office. And then I realized that my desk in the center of the office was moved towards the door because there was another desk in there, another male associate pastor was moving into that office with me without any consultation. So a lot of uh, bureaucracy and politics and all these things being an inter or being, you know, first year in, in ministry. So I decided to leave ministry at that point. I said, if I need to be heard, if I need to be taken seriously, I need to go and get what people want. And that was, in the Korean culture, Koreans love doctorates. <laughs> so I said, if that's what it's going to take, I'm going to go get a doctorate and I'll, I'll come back. <laughs> right? So I left to go to school. I left ministry, um, full-time ministry, but God was gracious to always give me an assignment on the side, on, on you know, uh, part-time. But I went and got my doctorate. And then it came full circle that God, God's call was always there, his affirmation and his training was all along there through, even through that big detour. But I've, I've come full circle to being in full-time ministry. Um, but it was a huge deterrent at that time. But in, in retro, retrospect, you realize, you know, I realize uh, what a tremendous uh, way of kind of uh, God shaping me in a way that I didn't expect yeah. uh, through that struggle. Wow, wonderful. Thank you, Deborah. I think Janelle has a question. I am a single mom, uh, a widow, raising three kids. And so the boundary issue that you're asking regarding academia really extends throughout different seasons of our lives, right? And so we have to guard and prioritize the things that God is calling us to. And those priorities will change over the seasons and course of our time. So I know what the Lord had called me to do. But I also knew that there was a period of time like where I wasn't going to travel. I wasn't going to travel to speak because my children needed me at home, and that season would have an end. And so I think part of what we have to do is help people not, real, not see that when you have a call from God that it's all going to happen right now, that God's going to continue to grow you and use the seasons of your life in order to equip you for ultimately how he's going to use you. So I think it's about having boundaries and priorities. I think that demands and requires self-reflection and time alone with the Lord. And I, I know the signs for myself. I know when I'm off kilter. I know the red flags that say, okay, I, I'm, I'm not living in clarity. I'm not living in a place that's balanced because I can't make a decision. I'm impatient. I'm, you know, I've, I've red flags that I've come to identify. So I think what I would say, Janelle, is um, that it's about making sure you know the season of life that you're in right now and that those priorities will shift. It doesn't mean that you have to put your call on the back burner. It means you have to know that 
for every person that God has called, he will send you to tend sheep for a period of time in order to train you, just like he did Moses, right? And we have to look at those seasons of life and make decisions based on those seasons. Um, I agree, Heidi. I, um, I didn't go back and get my education until my um, daughters were um, out, of the, out of the house. But I, what I want to say is it didn't mean I wasn't preaching. Um, you know, we, t we, we, are, we often highlight um, in the church that you are a pastor or you, are, you, know, you have a role in the church. But I, don't, I think we need to broaden that, that we are pastors whether we are teachers, whether we sell used cars, whether we check out at the grocery store, um, whether we're a doctor. It doesn't matter. We are called with the word of reconciliation where we are at, when we are there. And so my, my place before I actually went and got a formal education was to use the word of reconciliation in my family so that my children knew the word of reconciliation, so that their friends knew it, so that my neighbors, the women who would come over and have coffee, um, I didn't wait until my kids were out of the house to, to practice it or to know the word. And then I remember the year when my husband and my um, daughter graduated together, him with his master's um, and my daughter with her bachelor's. And right after the ceremony, when we went back to the house, my children and my husband turned to me and said, now it's your turn. And I've got to tell you, it has been a journey um, my husband is amazing. And now that I'm finishing up my doctorate, he's doing the laundry. <laughs> and, and my children have been amazing. They have been very supportive of what I'm doing. And so, you know, I didn't wait. I just didn't get the formal education. Um, and I think the education I got before I got to seminary dare I say this, was almost more powerful than what I'm getting in seminary. One more response and then we'll... Okay. Um, I have a, a three-year-old son and a 20-month-old daughter. And there's not a week that goes by that I don't wrestle with the demons that tell me that if I'm being a good pastor, I'm being a bad mom. And if I'm being a good mom, that I'm being a bad pastor. Every single week I wrestle with that in a significant way. When, but I will say that we're getting to a day and age where um, you don't have to necessarily put off the calling in order uh, to serve and to, and to do what God's called you to do. When my son was three months old, I was a youth pastor. When my son was born, I was a youth pastor. I was invited to speak at a youth retreat when he was three months old, and I brought him with me. And I would stand up and preach, and one of the teenage girls would hold him and rock him, and I'd say amen, and I'd go breastfeed him in the back of the room. I mean, it's a different day to be a mama, right? It is different. Um, I, I've brought my children with me into staff meetings and board meetings, and I know that it looks different than the super formal professional kinds of ministries sometimes and we're used to, but that's part of the wild thing that the Spirit is doing. When the Spirit of God calls sons and daughters to prophesy, it calls young mothers and old women. It calls all of us. And I think that in the embracing women in ministry is in part of embracing the wild thing that the Spirit's doing. And it shakes up the way that we think ministry ought to look like and church -like life ought to look like. But if young mothers cannot fully participate um, in the life of the church, then I think the church is not doing its job. Um, this summer, actually, I've just been accepted to begin the Doctor of Ministry program at Asbury Theological Seminary. And again, I wrestle with that of, of balancing motherhood, pastoring, um, doctoral ministry or doctoral pursuits. And yet there is a deep confidence in the fact that this is something that God is calling me to. And if the church is continuing to respond in the spirit, and if I am truly being led in the spirit, there will be space and there will be a way. And I keep telling her that I will do the laundry. And so, he does. Yes. He does laundry. <laughs> well, can we thank our panelists? Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, and now it's all your turn. Uh, there are some questions that are in your packets, I believe, that you've got at the front. And we have about 10 minutes. And around your tables, I just want you to think of these questions and share your thoughts on these. Uh, what are the pressing issues facing women in leadership today? 
And what are some ways that we can help women in leadership flourish and be successful? And then we'll come up and let you know. We'll give you a little two-minute warning when we're coming back. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm going to. And my prayer today is that your imaginations have been broken. And the panel was so excellent. I, we could have listened a long time. Thank you, every one of you who, who uh, participated. And, and I just as we were listening to that, I couldn't help but think of the different, out of the different cultural experiences in which we face this. Uh, it's different barriers that we uh, come across. And yet it's God who continues to call and God who continues to equip and God who continues to open the doors. And so today, I want to leave you with this commission. Now, I just want to tell you that there is some kind of an alarm that's gonna go off uh, because it goes off every time during this time or whatever, this thing, but the place is not on fire. <laughs> so if it goes off while, we're, while I'm giving this commission, don't worry, we are safe. It's a, it's a false alarm. <laughs> But it may be the alarm that God is saying, go <laughs> and, be my, and uh, take on my imagination. So I'm indebted to this commission that was written by um, Sarah Bazzi. I commission you in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. I commission you for the work of the gospel as a minister of Jesus Christ, to live in your world as an ambassador of the kingdom. I commission you in the work of healing and serving and loving and reconciliation. You are an emissary of justice, and your work from now on is to put things right, to call those things that are not as they will be. I pray that the God of hope would fill you with peace that passes all understanding. I pray that you will be drawn into communities so rich, so deep, so diverse, that you will disagree and fight and remain in fellowship together anyway. I pray that you will bring casseroles and prayer and laughter and tears to one another. I pray that you would have your toes stepped on, your feelings hurt, and that you would forgive. I pray that you would be given the gift of realizing you were wrong about some important things. I pray that you would be quick to seek forgiveness and make it right when you are the transgressor. Now go and do. You know Jesus. You have experienced the power and the grace with your own life. You have felt it in your own heart. Now go, heal, disciple, minister, love, loosen chains, throw open doors, bang your own pots and pans, speak, breathe, Prophesy, get behind a pulpit and preach, mark exam papers, run a company or a nonprofit, clean your kitchen, put paint on a canvas, organize, rabble rouse, find transcendence in the laundry pile while you pray in obscurity, <laughs> deliver babies for Haitian mothers in the midwifery clinic. Work the love out and in and around you, however God has made you to do it. Don't let the lies fence you in or hold you back. Love your spouse. Love your babies. Love the poor. Love the orphans. Love the widows. Love the powerful. Love the broken and hurting. Love your friends. Love yourself. And love your enemies. Love until you come to love the whole world in the fullness of God. In the full expression of the image bearer he created you to be. Just that. No more, but certainly no less. 
I call you to joy, friend. I set you apart in your right now life for the daily work of liberation and love. Proclaim, pro proclaim the kingdom of God with your hands and your feet and your voice to every soul in your care and influence. May your soul long for prayer and for the scriptures. May you keep secrets. May you give away your money. <laughs> 